The Australian Federal Budget. It's a big book and very useful in figuring out what the government is doing. It contains the country's physical performance, policy and projections. With a lot of data that goes over my head, reminding me why I hate math. So I decided to go through nearly every major policy to get to the bottom of it. My goal isn't to express opinions on the government, rather educate people on what's being done. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. Lightening the burden of existence was a touted Labor Party promise before the election. It's also a part of the modern Labor movement ideology, and most importantly, is just common sense for an elected government to be tackling as it directly affects massive portions of the voting population. Important to remember here is the word responsible, which implies limited impact to the government's coffers. There are three main areas in the federal budget to help with cost of living. Financial assistance, housing supply, and energy price relief. Financial assistance. Changes to single parent assistance will address money troubles and job difficulties faced by single parents due to additional responsibilities by giving them $922 per fortnight until the youngest child turns 14. Before the changes, parents with over eight went on single with dependent job seeker, which paid about $177 less, among other things. They've also increased income eligibility to around $2,600. The fact that 91% of single parents are women uh, also promotes gender equality. This policy change will affect roughly 57,000 people, so if you're a single mum with a bedwetter son, you might want to look at these changes and rake in that extra dry night nappy money. There'll be increases in job seeker and youth allowance of $40 a fortnight on top of increasing from inflation. To relieve cost of living pressure, the government has upped how much are those on working age benefits receive. This is especially the case for those who are over 55. Mature age recipients of job seekers have become significantly more common in the past decade, likely due to factors like poor health and no one wanting to smell out farts in their workplace. Due to this reliance, the government is extending job seeker payments to those from 55 to match with those 60 and over, affecting roughly 52,000 Australians. As for the youngins, hopefully that added $40 will help you until your Twitch career takes off, or at least pays the rent until you score a stint at the servo. Wages for aged care workers will be increasing. The government has moved $11.3 billion towards increasing the wages of 250,000 workers with a stated goal of continuing to improve wages until they reflect the proper worth of aged care workers. These increases are based on the Fair Work Commission's decision to provide an interim increase of 15% to minimum wages of aged care workers. This also means that the people most affected by wage increases will be those who are most affected by recent problems like inflation, low wage workers. Improving spinal mortality. Resolving housing problems is a state key priority of the current government. The federal budget lays out six noteworthy policies to tackle housing problems. Increased rent assistance, investment in housing supply, local and state reforms to increase housing supply, expanding guarantee eligibility, homelessness funding, and social slash affordable housing. Commonwealth rent assistance will be increased by 15% to 1.1 million households. Rent assistance is a supplementary payment, meaning it's paid on top of existing social security payments like Job Seeker. This is given to people paying rent to private houses, so it doesn't apply to those living in housing commissions or on their own. Costing $2.7 billion over five years, the government's goal is to reduce cost of living pressure for low income renters by mitigating the effects of increased rents. Government has put forward new changes to house building. First change is increasing the capital works tax deduction, reducing taxes on house renovations for landlords from 2.5 to 4 percent. So companies that make new build-to-rent properties can get tax money back. Developers would need the project to consist of 50 or more dwellings available for rent by the public or for lease terms of at least three years for each dwelling. So benefit will only apply if the buildings are actively being rented out, possibly meaning fewer houses will be left unoccupied collecting dust. This is on top of reducing tax that managed investment trusts have to withhold for the government from 30 to 15 percent, increasing foreign investment in development. Essentially, local councils through the Australian Local Government Association and ministers are hashing out a plan where local governments will be given money to spend on solving housing affordability. ALGA is advocating for $100 million per year from um, the government to help them deal with the issue, with their pre-budget statement saying it'll be used for activities like land audits, partnership developments, and housing model research, to name a few. The local government association cites the desire to solve the housing crisis is due to the struggle of towns to find accommodation, with the unique housing challenges each shire faces being their justification for playing a larger role in helping housing. I guess local Councils may soon be useful for more than just bin days.
Home guarantees are Australian government initiatives that allow eligible people to have part of their loan guaranteed by the government through the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation, or NHFIC, allowing you to get a home loan for a deposit as small as 5%. The government intends to expand guarantees for first-time and regional first-time buyers. Now, any two borrowers, even those not in a relationship, can apply for a first-time guarantee, along with those who own property in the past but haven't for 10 years. Family home guarantees are also expanded to single legal guardians of children rather than just biological parents. $67.5 million has been added on top of previous funding provided by the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, or yeah, which provides roughly $1.6 billion each year in states and territories with the aim of improving housing affordability. The yeah also requires the state strategies to address priority areas like social housing, tenancy reform, and home ownership, on top of requiring particular care around certain cohorts like children, elderly, and those undergoing repeat homelessness. As a new government is negotiated, factors like the previous agreement's success in reaching objectives, adequacy of data, and the impact of economic factors, among other things, will be reviewed to determine what improvements should be made. There is a long way to go, but with enough effort, using park benches for anything other than a place to sit and sex could be a thing of the past. The government has created an agenda to deliver more social and affordable housing through an increase to the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation's liability cap by $2 billion, making it $7.5 billion all up. This gives low-cost loans to community housing providers. This is projected to build 7,000 more homes directly. The federal budget describes an energy price relief plan designed to shield Australians from the price increases via price relief. The government says the reason behind this plan is to mitigate the effects of the Ukraine war, which have exacerbated power prices in the country. Policies in this area are as follows. After over 60 consultation submissions between December and February and a second round in April, the Commonwealth are committing to a mandatory code of conduct for gas sales with the goal of making sales to consumers fairer. The draft for this code includes potential actions to regulate the way gas suppliers conduct business, resolving disputes, and even require people to sell gas at a set price in particular circumstances. This could possibly reduce the cost of gas by forcing suppliers to sell gas at a set price in a local market, which makes sense as Australia is one of the largest gas producers and should not have some of the highest gas prices. $3 billion of electricity bill relief up to $650 for small businesses and $500 for households. This initiative, in partnership with states, will offer bill refunds. The goal of these rebates is to reduce pressure on vulnerable households. Generally, those with seniors cards, carers allowance, or low-income health cards, to name a few, will receive these rebates. In most cases, those eligible don't need to do anything. It'll automatically apply to the next power bill. Because this is in collaboration with the states, it may vary on how much you get and how it happens. $1 billion is being added to the Clean Energy Finance Corporation a specialist investor and self-described green bank, to enable 110,000 low-interest loans for energy-saving home upgrades in collaboration with other private lenders. The effect of upgrading a home's energy rating from a 1 out of 10 star to a 3 out of 10 star can reduce an energy bill by 30%, and by a further 20% if up to a 5 out of 10 star home. $300 million will also be spent to cut energy bills for 60,000 social housing properties by upgrading their energy performance in collaboration with the states. $36.7 million will be used to increase the government's energy efficiency standards and information, including an expression of the nationwide House Energy Rating Scheme to cover both existing and new buildings, allowing people to make more informed decisions. Conclusion. Cost of living is certainly the most publicised policy area of this year's budget, and with good reason. The numbers certainly seem modest, but that is not too surprising for a new government that is often heavily criticised by the fourth estate for its expenditure. In terms of where the money is going, I personally think it's going in the right places. But I would like to know what you think. But please, if you have any questions about any of these policies, please leave a comment. One of the four major goals of this government was said to be Medicare, which seems to mean access to affordable health care when needed and ensuring health workers, including doctors, are able to deliver it. The reason the Labor government considers it one of their major goals of the budget is due to their belief in Medicare being the foundation of the primary care system and claim that Medicare requires significant restructuring to meet the needs of the 21st century. I put a list of their new policies in three categories, access to medicine, access to medical care and improved health care infrastructure. Access to medicine. Jimmy, Jimmy, we have to sell more drugs. I don't know, Mr. Albanese. How are we gonna do that? The PBS, Jimmy. We'll expand the PBS. 
Welcome to Los Pharma Beneficio Schemata. We have a 2.2 billion dollar wider PBS, making more prescriptions affordable. My little pharmaceutical benefit scheme is responsible for subsidizing medicine costs, making them significantly more affordable. That's medicine, bitch. Two of my drugs added to the PBS include some zesty buprenorphine to treat opioid dependence and the freshest vosotide, which is used in treating a bone disorder called acrondoplasia. The purity of my government's medicine is without question. Relying on certain medications in your life is still the best at labor's PBS. But don't take old Butler's word for it. Dr. Gary Deed of the RACGP has welcomed his money-saving ways as well. Jimmy, we need to expand PBS operations. How, Mr. Albanese? We can only deliver so much medicine at a time. Scale, Jimmy. We'll double dispensing quantities. The government will be doubling maximum dispensing quantities allowed for over 300 PBS medicines. You now get 60 days worth of prescribed medicine instead of 30, reducing GP and pharmacy visits, saving both time and money. Australia's pharmaceutical benefits scheme lowers the prices of many of Australia's prescription medication by paying part of the cost of the medication. Dispense piecemeal. The idea of doubling dispensing was first loaded in 2018 after a payback recommendation said it would save money, with the RACGP claiming new reforms would save chronic patients $180 a year. But Mr. Albanese, where are we gonna get the savings from? I'm running a tight budget here, man. I, I won't keep getting harassed with this. Pharmacies, Jimmy. We'll undercut the pharmacies. Hey, I'm Dren Toomey. Did you know pharmacies have rights? The Guild says you do. I believe these savings from the PBS should not come at the expense of local pharmacies. I believe that we get to charge consumers and the government by proxy for every visit. I fight for you, Priceline. Opposing dispensing reforms in 2019, 2021, and again in the 2023 budget, RACGP says that I succeeded at preventing cheaper medicines in 2021, costing taxpayers $1.67 billion in dispensing fees, keeping it in your pharmacy's pockets. It's time we cut Trent off the deal, Jimmy. With this new policy, people with heart problems, Crohn disease, hypertension, and many other conditions can now spend less time in the pharmacy and more time subscribing to this channel. Like and comment, bitch. Medical care access. $3.5 billion has been spent to triple bulk billing incentives for patients aged under 16 and Commonwealth concession card holders, allowing face-to-face -face GP consultation and telehealth to 11 million people without any of the out-of-pocket expense, according to the AAP. Bulk billing means that instead of having to pay for a medical service, the government will cover the cost completely. However, not all doctors accept bulk billing, so tripling bulk billing incentives will mean that more doctors might choose to allow you to access them this way. Australia's healthcare system is getting many improvements in the federal budget, and this is but one of them. The federal budget has announced investments in complex and chronic care pathways by expanding items on a Medicare benefit schedule. The MBS is a list of health services subsidised by the Australian government that allows most of the costs of a listed service to be covered by Medicare. For example, if the fee to see your GB is $110, then Medicare might cover $76. It's one of the main ways medical care is able to stay affordable for most Australians. In line with the recommendations from the Independent Medical Services Advisory Committee, or MSAC, $170.6 million is being spent to introduce new services to the schedule. This includes, but is not limited to, $1.2 million to genetically test whether parents planning pregnancy are carriers of cystic fibrosis, spinal muscular atrophy, or fragile X syndrome. $32.6 million for positron emission tomography, or PET, to help determine the extent of rare and uncommon cancers in patients. $143.9 million will be spent on non-emergency healthcare outside GP hours, including $93.4 million extending primary health networks PHN after hours program by a third of two years. PHNs are essentially war rooms of healthcare, keeping all the local clinics linked up and working efficiently, and commissioning services when gaps in healthcare need to be addressed. Extending the aftercare programs intends to reduce the burden of hospitals by giving people access to GP services outside of normal working hours. $358 million will be invested in new service called Medicare Urgent Care Clinics. 58 will be built around the country, eight more than promised during the election. These clinics are considered a no model of care, built to reduce burdens on hospital and based in existing offices. This service will accept walk-in patients after normal hours to treat non-life-threatening injuries that require urgent care like fractures. Being in existing centres was pushed by the Royal Australian College of GPs, who wanted GPs to get more access to people with acute illnesses. Australian healthcare has an internet problem. Thank you.
Not like you have an internet problem with your doom scrolling and hyperpop cat remixes. The Commonwealth Digital Health Record System, known as My Health Record or MHR, is severely outdated, underused, and hard to work with. The first electronic health record, called PCEHR, was made in 2012 to save GB's time collecting patient information. Its name was changed to MHR in 2015 under the Turnbull government. The record system lacked many basic features. With Radiology College SEO Mark Nevin saying in the 2016 Senate inquiry that the system didn't even have the technical capacity to store images, including x-rays, which can make it difficult to diagnose conditions like black lung as historical records are harder to come by. The Australian Financial Review reported in 2019 that My Health Records, bad UI, low participation and overcomplicated nature has meant that whatever records are on the system are not being effectively updated or used, reducing information GPs have on patients. What is being done to fix this? Well, in the 2023-24 federal budget, the Albanese the Labor government committed $429 million to modernise the My Health Records system, intending the turn system used from a tenth of the time to become the rule rather than the exception. This includes modernising information and billing systems from old formats, eliminating ones no longer in use, and ensuring the MHR is well entrenched in the medical system. Broadening opportunities in our society and around the country. The third key goal of the 2023-24 budget was, in essence, equality, an idea that has been fundamental to the labour movement since its earliest forms and nowadays serves as a buzzword for any institution imaginable. It's interesting to see how the Labor government interprets the term through their new policies. Broadly speaking, this section focuses on closing gaps, with policies targeted towards marginalised aspects of certain demographics, especially women, children and Aboriginal people. The policies here can be categorised into three sections, childcare and gender equality, national plan to end violence against women and children, and closing gaps with regional and Indigenous communities. Childcare and gender equality. The government is improving the paid parental leave scheme. Parental leave pay and dad and partner pay, both forms of payment given to people to look after new children, will combine into a single 20-week payment that can be shared between parents, which can be claimed by either parent, including single ones. Both parents who are passed an income and work desk can spend up to 100 payable days receiving the national minimum wage, which is currently 819.9 a week. The work test requires you have worked at least 10 out of 13 months before birth with a minimum of 300 30 hours worked in that time. And the income test requires under $150,000 individual adjusted taxable income. Family incomes of less than $350,000 are also now eligible, affecting 3,000 parents. Beforehand, both parents had to seek payment through different systems, reducing eligibility and income benefits. This policy essentially gives both parents the same benefits from the government, giving women a bigger advantage in the workplace. The government has incurred cheaper early childhood education for 1.2 million families through changing the child gear subsidy. The childcare subsidy is used by the government to cover a portion of your childcare costs when you bring your kids to approved early childhood education centres. The amount that the government will cover will depend on the family's income and can be calculated online. According to the Department of Education, families on 80 grand or less will have the subsidy lifted to as high as 90% and a family on 120k with a child in care three days a week could save $1,700 a year. These subsidies are complemented by a $72.4 million package to train more childhood educators. These subsidies will make it easier for parents to work or do other activities while their kids are in care. The government has just changed the Workplace Gender Equality Act of 2012 to require gender pay gap information to be published by the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, WGEA. WGEA was established in 2012 to promote gender equality in workplaces, typically through advice, tools and education. These changes to the amendment are part of a continuing expansion of the government to ensure gender is part of all major budget decision making, to ensure quality of payment. National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children. $589 million to support stopping domestic violence, including tackling intergenerational disadvantage in communities. This is on top of $1.7 billion on the previous budget. $159 million is being used to extend the Family Domestic and Sexual Violence Response Partnership Agreement with states which intend to boost frontline delivery. The government is also strengthening sexual assault consent laws and making them more uniform through improvements to the family law system, addressing barriers of justice, including addressing gaps in supporting victims of visas. Uh, $194 million will be used to establish dedicated Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Action Plan, which will include culturally responsive healing programs, addressing immediate safety concerns, and community-led services for First Nation children and families dealing with DV. 
The National Redress Scheme NRS, is a program providing support to remedy victims of institutional child exploitation. It was made in response to the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse in 2012, which saw tens of thousands of calls and messages confirming that thousands of children were abused in various Australian institutions. The Albanese government has given NRS services an additional $142.2 million to ensure those who experienced institutional child sex abuse can continue accessing free, independent support in a safe and trauma-informed way. The money will go towards compensating victims through continuing the redress support services. Remote Australia will receive $199.8 million in an integrated package to address entrenched and concentrated disadvantage in Australian communities in collaboration with states. There are four notable parts of this package. $64 million to extend Stronger Places, Stronger People initiative, comprising and led by 10 communities across Australia, combining data, local understanding and evidence-based solutions to disrupt patterns of disadvantage. $7.8 million to construct a whole of government framework to address community disadvantage. Whole of government frameworks were formed between ministers and central agencies to keep departments working in sync together. $16.4 million for a life course data initiative, which is designed to capture data insights and improve how community disadvantages understood. $100 million outcomes fund. Outcomes funds are pools of money paid to people for achieving social outcomes. This will include $11.6 million to fund social enterprise development initiatives. This is designed to support organisations that intend to find financially sustainable ways to achieve positive social outcomes. One of the biggest unheard of actions the government has taken is spending $561 million to increase Indigenous Australian health, including $238 million to improve workers' capacity to treat cancer and 30 extra dialysis units being sent to regional and remote areas. $38.4 million to support some of the first community-led models of distance learning for remote Aboriginal children. An example of community-led Aboriginal education includes the Northern Land Council's Learning on Country program, which was extended by six years in 2022. It involves education by rangers and community elders to make new custodians of the country and employ massive portions of the community. $150 million to improve regional water security through the National Water Grid Fund, helping to close the gap in the 2023 Commonwealth Closing the Gap Implementation Plan. The fund is used on projects proposed by local communities to improve water supply and are approved by the National Water Grid Investment Framework. $20.8 million spent to undertake urgent repairs for Aboriginal Hostels Limited, AHLs and accommodation services with over 40 hostels, giving Aboriginal people a safe place to stay when leaving town for medical or family reasons. Investing in a stronger and more secure economy. This is probably one of the most extensive group of reforms by the government based on sheer volume and so will be split into two parts. The first is renewable technology in the environment, the second will be commercial and industrial. The meaning behind this section appears to be converting the nation's strengths into long-lasting growth, primarily through refining our natural minerals and making use of renewable power. Categories here include renewable energy, powering net zero industries and jobs, environmental policies and disaster resilience. Renewable energy. Biggest argument against renewables is the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. This is wrong. Somewhere in the world the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. All we need to keep harvesting it is a big enough grid that can draw power from anywhere. The Australian government plans on making it. $12 billion of its $20 billion investment in rewiring the nation will be spent on transformational transmission projects, putting its grid on track to becoming 82% renewable by 2030. Upgrading the systems responsible for transmission will allow the reliable use of multiple sources of power, which is vital to using renewable technology. Power production is one thing, but making sure that power is distributed and stored in such a way that everyone can constantly use the power requires some heavy infrastructure. The government is spending $12 billion to secure the electricity grid. What kind of things can you get done with that budget? For starters, $1 billion of low-cost debt loans was invested in Tasmania's Battery of the Nation project, which will use hydropower in places like Lake Kethena to store energy. $1.5 billion will also be seen for Victorian Renewable Energy Zones, RES, and offshore wind. Renewable Energy Zones are areas determined to be most ideal for building renewables on, a bit like planetary features in Stellaris. On top of that, $4.7 billion will unlock critical transmission and RES in New South Wales, including plugging in Snowy 2.0. Other examples include the Hunter Transmission Project, where the uniquely potent renewable sources and existing mining infrastructure could see massive investment in green industry. All these projects will be linked by massive electricity interconnectors like the Marinus Link, which is a $3 billion wire planned to connect Tasmania and Victoria.
Turning power on and off at a whim is much harder on a nationwide scale, but this new scheme will make it possible. The capacity investment scheme will tender the delivery of renewable generation and storage to the southeastern states to unlock $10 billion of new investment. The government wishes to increase the amount of power that can be turned on and off on demand, known as dispatchable power, by offering to underwrite, essentially take risk for, investors to build dispatchable renewable sources like grid batteries. A desire to prevent the 2022 winter energy crisis caused by the Liberal government failing to maintain in the grid, allowing 4 gigawatt dispatchable power grid to be replaced with a 1 gigawatt power grid, along with just modernising the Australian energy grid, are the known motivators behind this initiative. This is just one of the hundreds of complementary power projects fell in into place nationwide, and it's an amazing sight to see. There are two ways to decrease carbon usage, increasing renewable energy usage and decreasing general power usage. The government is doing a lot to make renewables, but also has some neat carrots to help you or your business make the most of it. $1.3 billion is allocated to a household energy upgrades fund, which will provide cheap loans to houses for various energy saving projects like solar and more efficient appliances. For businesses with under $50 million turnover, $310 million will also be invested to give tax deductions for upgrading their electrical systems efficiency through the small business energy incentives. The max claim is 20% tax off any assets related to improving energy efficiency and can be up to $100,000 of cost, potentially saving $20,000. This is predicted to affect 3.8 million businesses and apply to all upgrades used or installed until the 30th of June 2024. There is now a proper plan to get Australians to adopt and afford electric cars. This part of this plan is a national electric vehicle strategy which intends to outline a broad idea for adopting electric cars. This strategy contains three objectives, increase supply of affordable EVs, establish EV infrastructure and encourage EV demand. The first policy enacted under this strategy is $7.4 million to support fuel efficiency standards designed to encourage the supply of more EVs. $7.8 million for the Transport and Infrastructure Net Zero Roadmap and Action Plan, organising the many changes to how emissions can be reduced in transport, including alternative fuel, new technology and improved infrastructure like rail, something that was unsurprisingly welcomed by the Australasian Railway Association. Powering Net Zero Industries and Jobs. What is the future of fuel in Australia? The $2 billion Hydrogen Head Start program will support large-scale renewable hydrogen projects through competitive contracts. Hydrogen is a renewable combustible fuel that can be used for industrial heat, heavy transport fuel and potentially manufacturing purposes. Contracts for two to three flagship projects, including $2 million for Indigenous consultation support, will have the goal of providing one gigawatt of electrolyzer capacity and build on the basis for the hydrogen industry to expand and further. It has become more difficult to invest in renewables in Australia due to the US increasing their competition and taking away the expertise and investors needed for the cutting edge projects. $38.2 million will be spent to establish a guarantee origin scheme which will reliably track where emissions come from. Australia plans on becoming a renewable energy superpower by manufacturing their own technology. But how are they going to get the minerals for it? $57.1 million will be spent to develop the Critical Minerals International Partnership Program, working with countries like the US, Japan and others. This will advance mineral sciences, sustainable practice and address risks to supply chains, which is seen from the pandemic and cause devastation to productivity when disrupted. This program secures all the necessary resources to build a renewable manufacturing industry with a $2 billion critical minerals facility and $15 billion national reconstruction fund. The country will soon be able to sustain even major economic disruption and still keep growing. As the world's number one producer of lithium and titanium, the second largest producer of zircon and top five producer of other rare earth minerals, this partnership program also secure the renewable energy future for all countries involved. How are Australia's small businesses supposed to capitalise on the renewable energy boom? The new federal budget outlined $14.8 million to establish something called the Powering Australia Industry Growth Centre. Designed to support businesses in making, commercialising or adopting renewables. Industry growth centres are not-for-profit organisations led by experts in industry trying to lead cultural change in the sector. This growth centre will get minerals, producers and renewables manufacturers rubbing shoulders. Additionally, $3 billion is allocated to investments on low emission tech like green metals under the National Reconstruction Fund. All these policies come in the context of strong competition with the American government whose administration's Inflation Reduction Act has stolen many renewable investors from spending their resources and expertise in our country. Will Australia make up for lost time to become the renewable energy superpower it dreams to be? Only time will tell. 
Will Australia compete with America's record investment in renewable energy? $5.6 million will be used to analyse new implications of the increased competitiveness of renewable energy for Australia and ways to find new opportunities. The world is at a critical point in renewable energy industry and Australia has all the necessary components to become a renewable energy superpower. But with the USA still and all the investors and expertise, along with a wasted decade under the previous gas bag government, it's not clear if Australia can become the power of its dreams. The government is going full war economy to reach its renewable energy targets. Just like in the war days, $8.3 million will be spent over four years to develop and issue green bonds. Often issued by the government, bonds are bought by investors with the promise that they will be paid back by the issuer in the future with interest. These green bonds are designed to raise money for investing in renewable projects to get the country to net zero emissions. Additionally, in an echo of the war era stock taken of the curtain period, $1.6 million is being spent to co fund with private companies the Australian Sustainable Finance Taxonomy, which is essentially a list that defines all the economic activities that count as sustainable. Companies lying about their environmental friendliness seems like an everyday occurrence, soon could be a thing of the past. The Commonwealth is moving $4.3 million to bolster ASIC enforcement against greenwashing in order to remain competitive in global capital markets. Greenwashing is when a company overstated its environmental friendliness. ASIC is already enforced against multiple superannuation companies, with one of the largest being against Mercer Superannuation, whose sustainable plan that claimed to not invest in fossil fuels had money invested in 15 different fossil fuel companies companies from Whitehaven Coal to BHP. Finally, no more companies of names like Evil Planet Burner LTD claim to be carbon neutral. The government rushed the Governor General to establish a new executive called the Net Zero Authority. Focusing on regions and industry, this new agency will be composed of an independent chair and supported by an advisory board. It is responsible for promoting an orderly and effective transformation of net zero emissions that allows communities most affected to not get left behind in the rush of the world's greatest boom since the Industrial Revolution. Workers in emission intensive sectors will get access to new skills and support to help them transition to a different sector. Regions will get extra programs to ensure industries in their areas will benefit them and investors and companies will be supported to better engage with projects related to net zero. The government will be using the power in the regions fund to populate the regions and turn them into an unshakable superpower. Core to the Powering Regions Fund is reducing emissions in regional areas using a special net zero economy task force. Existing industries like mining will be made more carbon neutral and have the generated wealth feed back into the towns that made them, turning the country from a desolate seven city backwater into a booming continent wide federation and world power. The government is still nailing out how exactly it will use the Powering the Regions Fund to build up the regions, but complementing it already includes massive regional projects like hydrogen hubs create clean fuel and the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility to ensure the things built in the region suffer no funding delays. Environmental policies, a sustainable future. Beyond just focusing on renewable energy, the government has also outlined new policies relating to the actual environment itself. The stated reason behind these policies is that Australia's natural environment offers economic benefits and is of unique cultural and heritage value. The Murray-Darling Basin, Australia's largest and most complex river system, will have over $103 million pumped into sustaining this million square kilometre water network through re reviewing the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Droughts and increasing human use made the need to manage the basin water use in line with the Water Act of 2007 more pertinent. So the Murray-Darling Basin Plan was enacted by the 2012 Gillard Labor Government and followed through by the affected states. Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek says the plan has been sabotaged by the previous Liberal National Government, a statement reflected by journalists like Michael West, noting insufficient requirements for managing the Northern Basin Plan in 2017, and the documentary Blood Water by YouTuber Friendly Geordies, who placed much of the blame for the Basin's troubles on the New South Wales National Party. With their new investment in the plan's review, the government aims to both update the plan to change in the basin's conditions and ensure the use of climate change policy, scientific understanding and indigenous knowledge. In 2022, though, your government released a nature positive plan. This plan was based on a simple premise. If our laws don't change, our trajectory of environmental decline will not change either. Based on a report by Graham Samuel AC, it was intended to improve environmental protections, get departments dependent on environment decisions, and make doing the right thing easier. The new budget has moved the plan further, $121 million to establish Environmental Protections Australia and $51 million to establish Environment Information Australia. Environment Protection Australia will serve like an environmental protection agency. Independent and bound to transparency, it will make assessments 
assessments, approvals, and conditions relating to the environment. According to Mirage News, new laws being negotiated will enhance the new agency's powers in preventing biodiversity loss. Environment Information Australia will be a data body which will provide quality information about the environment with the intent to be used in regulation planning and reporting. Australia is large and diverse, which means it has a lot of national parks. According to Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek, however, they have been neglected under the previous government, with programs to protect threatened species, protect native animals, and maintain infrastructure all suffering mismanagement. The federal government has outlined a total of $355.1 million to address chronic underfunding of national parks. With special mention being given to Kakadu, where a range of stations are falling apart, and Uluru Kataduja, where basic shade and housing facilities are highly inadequate. Disaster resilience. Natural disasters have devastated Australia from the get-go, but they have reached near unfathomable scales in recent years, with by far the most notable disaster being the 2019 bushfires, whose memory only fades with the pandemic that came after. $200 million will be moved to a disaster ready fund to support disaster relief projects. This fund will be made available to state and territory governments and involve partnership with local councils. Projects can include improving drainage to reduce flood risks, data sharing initiatives to better communicate and predict when events occur, and fire breaks in evacuation centres to reduce the damage when bushfire season begins. A lot more needs to be done and is being done to reduce the impact of Australia's increasing natural disasters. Nevertheless, this fund goes a long way in ensuring disasters like the 2019 bush fires from the 2021-22 Queensland floods don't do the scale of damage that they did in the past. Does a government ever apologise for the actions of its previous regime? It's not common, but in the case of Australia, they kind of have. The 2019 bushfires was one of the worst fires in world history and it saw the Prime Minister who defunded the services meant to prevent and manage them take an holiday in Hawaii when hell literally broke loose. Come election time and he inevitably lost to a far more pro not letting houses burn down leader named Anthony Albanese. In the 2023-24 federal budget he allocated $8.4 billion over five years to reimburse states for past disasters to make amends for the previous government's complete inaction. This was on top of billions of dollars in 2022 for a disaster recovery allowance going directly to those still affected by natural disasters. It's a rare and pretty sight to see a government own up to the mistakes of its predecessors, but Australia shows that once in a red smoking moon, it is possible. Investing in a stronger and more secure economy. This is probably one of the most extensive group of reforms by the government based on sheer volume and so will be split into two parts. The first is renewable technology in the environment, the second will be commercial and industrial. Part two, agriculture, industry growth programs, supporting small businesses. Agriculture, Great. From the days of yams and native wheat to lackadaisical sheep, laborious wheat and arduous cattle growing. Agriculture has been an important basis for this continent's economy. There have been changes and reforms to how it's being managed by the government. Tonight on Biosecurity. A total of $1 billion will be thrown at a new biosecurity system over the next four years, along with another $260 million every year after. This produce needs to go under risk analysis before being processed. The Biosecurity Patrol will now be using country of origin to determine the risk of the product. The product might then have to go under quarantine and surveillance to be checked on for diseases by experts. Hey guys, did you know that in Tasmania, family members are the only things getting wet? The government intends to increase water security for Tasmanian farming using the National Water Grid Fund, a national infrastructure investment program. The government has funded two perfectly compatible schemes to unlock Tasmania's true potential in sustaining big growth. $109 million towards the Northern Midlands Irrigation Scheme, including 25 gigalitres of irrigation water affecting farmers in places from Campbelltown to Longford. $62.1 million for the Sassafras West Lee Vale Irrigation Scheme, which will include 14 gigalitre boost to keep the 19,000 hectares involved perfectly wet. In a dry country like Australia, greatly increasing our base stats for water security and having access to irrigation defence will allow us to be more rough with our water. 
As much as I hate the name, the federal government is going to make the Bureau of Meteorology become the bomb. The bomb.com. $32.7 million will be invested to develop data and information systems by the Bureau of Meteorology for water funding in the Murray Darling. This will additionally help implement the Murray Darling Basin Plan. Between about Nain Gorlin to saving the country's largest and most important water system, this has got to be one of the biggest departmental blow ups of the decade. Climate change will make farming more difficult. There's no doubt about it. What is the government doing about this? The Department of Agriculture has $38.3 million to spend over four years to enhance the capacity of the government to assist farmers with dealing with climate change impacts and better manage agricultural data. Using the Australian Bureau of Agricultural Resource Economics and Sciences, ABARS, the department's research wing, about $16 million will be spent on simply improving data in the region. 9.4 to collect information on low emission methods and tech used by farmers, and 12.8 million to look into the effect of international emissions policies on Aussie agriculture. All policies designed to give farmers access to the best information. This policy will not solve all the problems that climate change will have on the industry, but it will be a start. Industry growth. $392.4 million will be spent on something called the Industry Growth Program. This program is designed to give funding and advice to small and medium businesses in specific areas like renewables, medicine, transport and agriculture. The program will contain experienced advisors to guide small businesses and independent committee responsible for granting funding, centre of expertise and additional sources of industry advice from the not-for-profit sector. This means that if you have a good idea for a business in the area, you might have a great opportunity to get started off the bat. Australia's gone through a new industrial revolution. The National Reconstruction Fund is a $15 billion plan to rebuild Australia's industry, which currently sits at the bottom of the OECD for self-sufficiency and intends to grow to $30 billion by partnering with businesses. Through a series of loans and guarantees, Australia will realise grand plans and manufacture its own transport and renewables, research medicine, localised defence manufacturing and greatly boost specialist sectors like IT, along with already strong sectors like mining. With plans like these, not only will Australia become less dependent on the world for all its materials, it may very well become become the key nation others must appeal to in order to get vital components they need to make with things like windmills, batteries and trains. Australia will now produce nuclear technology, not for power or weapons though, but for medicine. The construction of a nuclear medicine manufacturing facility has been announced by the government to protect the rare radiopharmaceutical Technetium 99M from supply chain issues like those caused during the pandemic, allowing nuclear imaging for diseases affecting half of Australians to continue without interruption. The process uses a reactor to fission uranium and produce molybdenum 99 which is extracted, purified and placed in a special generator that extracts the Technetium 99M from it. The purpose of this facility is not only to meet domestic supply but also attempt to fill international demand for the sought after material. So if ever you get mad sick there's a 50-50 chance you might have nuclear medicine to thank for figuring it out. The Australian government wants to use its military budget to invest in new technologies. $3.4 billion will be spent to establish the Advanced Strategic Capabilities Accelerator, AXA, designed to transform defence innovation. This investment is in response to the Defence Strategic Review, which advocated for the Army to have stronger links to newer technology. The main technologies that will be focused on include hypersonics, directed energy, trusted autonomy, quantum technology, information warfare and long-range fires. Sounds like weapons. Australia is waltzing its way to a new and advanced military tech, one of which is hypersonics, which are devices capable of reaching speeds faster than Mach 5 at heights below 90 kilometers. Called at times game changers in warfare by people like Stephen Simon of the New York Times and treated with caution by ANU International Relations Fellow Benjamin Zala. This technology has been around for decades, but recent changes have seen newer missiles be far more maneuverable, with most of the great powers like US and China already developing them as a means to compromise an adversary's nuclear capabilities, it has a lot of defensive potential. Australia is literally entering the space age with its military looking into this new tech, directed energy. In this case, it refers to high energy laser, HEL, and high powered radio frequency, HPRF, weapons. So literally laser weapons. Straight up, the government <laughs> wants to make laser guns. Although still primitive in functionality, the application of this technology is not hard to imagine. Already the United States has used this type of technology successfully, with the Athena laser weapon taking down 5 UAVs and 60 kilowatt Helios laser weapon system being added to a USA destroyer. Most applications appear to be in dealing with electronics, which is certainly useful in the modern day. You ever wonder if completely automated weapons like those turrets you see in Portal and Half-Life could be real? Well Australia might be the one to show it off. 
trusted autonomy. Completely automated weapons and robots like mine clearing devices support droids in automated underwater vessels. According to the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, there is a lot of technical issues surrounding automated weapon systems that make its reliability still unachievable. The applications of artificial intelligence in defense of the nation, along with possible civilian applications of technology, make it a prime field of research to ensure the country's prosperity. A unique way of doing real fast math has finally piqued the interest of the Australian military. Quantum technology, $40.2 million will be added on top of access to research quantum computing in ways that meet needs, fill markets and can be achieved. Quantum computers are experimental devices that use the weird properties of subatomic particles to do calculations. The different way that these computers are able to do these computations means that certain calculations are done much faster than normal computers. The National Quantum Strategy set the goal for Australia to develop the world's first error corrected quantum computer. Quantum computers are highly sensitive to the outside world and can lose coherence and become corrupt. Making the first error correcting computer will be monumental in making quantum computers useful. You are not immune to propaganda and the Australian government knows it. Which is why the military has invested in Information warfare. The world moving from an industrial to an information age means that the government intends to increase its influence and status in both protecting Australia from foreign propaganda and spreading information to other countries. In the industrial age, people directly controlled their physical environment. If you had a car, you'd drive it with a steering wheel and a stick. If you had a gun, you'd shoot and reload with the trigger and clip. With information environments, there is a non-physical element in between. You give commands to a software, which then gives a command to the machine. Being able to manipulate that in-between space is the main focus of the military. When you live in an isolated continent, you need your weapons to have range, and the Australian military knows it. Long range fires. Long range strike missiles used to fire at targets far from the launch location would be sensible for the defense of a large and isolated country like Australia. A sentiment reflected by the Defense Strategic Update. The government wants to acquire the ability to produce A2AD system missiles like the Land 8113 Long Range Fires, which will have a range over 500 kilometers. Comrades, $286 million to initiate a five-year plan to renew Australian art, entertainment and culture could revive. Following five pillars to greatly leap the glorious Australian entertainment industry forward. First Nations first, a place for every story, centrality of the artist, strong cultural infrastructure and engaging the audience. Support the small business. Replacing the previous government's business tax break snuck in during the pandemic, $20,000 instant asset write-offs will be available for businesses with less than $10 million of annual income. Asset write-offs are claims on the amount paid in taxes on an item purchased for use in business. Anything from industrial ovens or for your restaurants to even video game skins for your channel. This change increases the amount of money businesses can claim on their tax for equipment. $20,000 instead of a grand. While limiting what businesses can make those claims. Those making under $10 million are now eligible rather than those making up to $500 million in annual turnover. Big companies like Coca-Cola and Boeing can't write off billions in assets anymore. And now the more local businesses can make claims on expensive and important commercial equipment. Estimated to cost $290 million over four years in cash flow support, this policy is much cheaper than the previous version. One thing I always thought funny about America was how stressful they found taxes there. It seems so much easier in Australia, and even easier it will become. It will now be even quicker to interact with the ATO. Paperwork duplication will be combated through changes to the single touch payer or SDB system, giving tax agency authority to act on the business's behalf for longer periods of time. Additional tax clinics will be opened, with at least two delivered through tape. These clinics have students studying tax related courses to provide supervised tax advice for free. The federal government has announced several policies to ensure a safe and secure cyberscape for small businesses. $2 billion will be invested in ICT to ensure digital services are accessible for people and businesses. $23.4 million will be spent to increase cybersecurity for businesses by training people in a business on basic cyber safety. Cybersecurity being responsible for about $33 billion in reported losses. $88 million to support consumer data rights, CDR. CDR is an opt-in service for specific sectors that allows you to upload your data securely in order to make comparing products and services easier. 
The government wants to make apprenticeships easy to obtain. Australia has seen a reduction of trade apprenticeships by almost 20,000 since 2012. This has led to massive skill shortages, including in the construction industry, which is greatly impacting the housing affordability crisis as there isn't enough people to build houses. Improvements to apprenticeship support services will be made with the goal of increasing completion rates of skills, which will get them in the workforce. The plan will include assessments of each apprenticeship's needs, increasing their accessibility of mentorship making existing support services more proactive, giving employees improved learning tools, implementing technology and furthering workplace experience options. This was committed in the Jobs and Skills Summit and announced in the 2023 budget. Remember the old reading writing hotline? One three double oh six triple five oh six. Good times. Well, it seems the government is spending more on programs like these. Expanding the foundation skills training to ensure Australians 15 years and over have the basic language, literacy, numeracy, and digital skills needed to participate in future work and education, known as foundation skills. Roughly three million working age Australians lack basic skills expected from employers. Programs considered a part of foundation skills training include the Skills for Education and Employment Program, C. Near universally accessible training for basic literacy and numeracy skills and foundation skills for your future program, which supports employed and recently unemployed Australians who need flexible training to improve basic skills. Apprentices will be everywhere now. The new Australia Skills Guarantee will ensure one out of 10 workers in government construction and ICT jobs will be in an apprenticeship or trainee. Starting with major construction and IT sectors, this guarantee intends to expand to every notable sector of trade in the country. Although yet to be implemented, key design and implementation timeframes have been announced in the latest budget, and over 100 organisations and professionals have been consulted on how to do this. This program intends to prevent the major skill shortage facing the country, like those in construction, which is reducing housing supply and one of the many reasons that stable accommodation has become more difficult in recent years. Negotiating with states for a five-year national skills agreement, NSA, to strengthen the VET sector for critical and emerging industries. If these negotiations are successful, funding will be available for reform in areas like foundation skills, fee-free TAFE courses, equality programs, and many more. Increasing and retaining a teacher supply, strengthening their education, and elevating them as a profession. Those are the key priority areas in the federal government's National Teacher Workforce Action Plan. Expanding on $328 million on the previous budget, $9.3 million will be added to the National Teacher Workforce Action Plan, including assistance and guidance for early career teachers. Although this reflects an attempt to fix one of the greatest issues facing the teaching sector at the moment, the AARE says more needs to be done to address other concerns like compensation for pre-service teachers taking professional placements, and the need to upgrade and maintain school infrastructure. Government-wide daddy daycare. Finding a place to dump your kids before their school years is a difficult task. As someone who has worked at creation in the past, I know how unbearably exhausting kids can be. Childcare centres are more needed than ever when it, often parents need two incomes to get by. So what's the government doing about it? $72.4 million will be spent to support early childhood education training, including $34.4 million to support educators professional development and $37.9 million to give financial assistance to educators in getting bachelor or postgraduate degree. This new policy intends to affect 80,000 childhood educators, many from the regions. The package will include backfilling positions and upskilling existing educators to meet the demand for more childcare. Conclusion. This budget, in my opinion, is like one of those treat dispensing dog toys. Inside of it is something for everyone, whether you're struggling to get by or struggling to keep your business afloat. This toy will slowly drip the little treats you need as you chew it out. It's not the food bowl you need to stay fed, but it will stave off hunger and keep you busy. Ciao.